Welcome to Cooper Union. Hello, I'm Mike Essel. <clears throat> I'm the Dean of the School of Art. Um, this is our Alex Katz chair lecture this evening. And I want you to know that the Alex Katz chair was founded in 1999 with generous support of alumnus Alex Katz. The chair provides a one semester visiting professorship to a distinguished artist working in the field of painting and drawing, which brings us to tonight's lecture. Duran Langberg is a Brooklyn-based painter whose practice hinges on a sense of closeness. Langberg's paintings, luminous in color and often large in scale, celebrate the physicality of touch in subject matter and process. His intimate yet expansive take on relationships, sexuality, nature, family, and the self proposes how painting can both portray and create queer subjectivity. Born in 1985 in Yokneum, Moshava, Israel, Duran currently lives and works in New York City. He received his MFA from Yale University School of Art, holds a BFA from the University of Pennsylvania, a certificate from PAF PAFA? PAFA yeah. Thank you, PAFA, and attended the Yale Summer School of Music and Art in Norfolk. Langberg has attended the EFA studio program, the Sharp Walentis studio program, the Yadu artist residency, and the queer art mentorship program. He is the recipient of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, John Koch Award for Painting, the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation Grant, and the Yale Shul <laughs> Shulkopf travel prize. Langberg's work has been included in a major group, uh, sorry, will be included in a major group exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston in 2022. Previously, his work has been shown at institutional venues, including the RISD Museum, the Schwalles? Schwal Museum, L LSU Museum, American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Leslie Lohman Museum, the PAFA Museum. His work is in the collection of the PAFA Museum, RISD Museum, and the ICA Miami. Please join me in welcoming Duran Langberg. Hi guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mike, for this um, introduction. Thank you. Um, and also just thank you for um, welcoming me this semester to the Cooper community. It's really been a pleasure to teach here and get to know the students. And um, it's very, um, very much a privilege to, to, be, um, to be here. Oh yes, it's my notes. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna start my timer. So, I'm, so I know where I am. Um, so just a, a, few, a few words about my um, practice in general. Um, I usually um, paint people who are close to me that are in my immediate community, whether it's family members, friends, um, my partner. Um, and I try to focus on um, color, touch, materiality um, as means to describe the, um, both the external, uh, both my external world and um, the emotional reality of the, the sitter and my relationship to them. Um, I wanted to kind of start by showing a little bit of my influences, like artists that I've looked at um, and influenced me throughout my practice. Um, as you could see, um, from the previous image, I'm deeply influenced by Bonnard. Um, I really love his sense of color and his ability to essentially use every color in, in every painting, uh, which is extremely hard to, to juggle and make a coherent um, color sense out of. Um, so I'm always in awe with his use of color. And I always, I felt that, um, so I am slightly nervous, so I feel like I'll, I'll relax over time. Um, I feel like what's unique about Bonnard is, is the, um, 
the feeling that we get looking at his paintings is always very familiar. And I could always identify um, the time of day or the sense of light that he's trying to create. Um, but he's using these extremely expressive and luminous colors to do that. So for me, kind of this idea of um, a color world that's unique to painting or can only exist in painting, but parallels our observational world um, is really inspiring. And this is an etching by David Hockney. Um, and Hockney was probably one of the first queer artists that I've kind of come to know uh, when I was a teenager. Um, and for me, what was really inspiring about his work was really the, um, his sense of freedom with the subject matter that he could really describe um, a still life or a friend or a partner um, all with the same ease and kind of really travel between these different, uh, these different subjects. Um, so for me, kind of thinking about my own, my own work and my own um, broad range of subject matter, that was kind of, I was looking to him as a guide. Um, of course, I don't think that anyone can talk about portraiture without mentioning Alice Neal. Um, she's an incredible inspiration and uh, just like the sheer humanity that she's able to capture in her portraiture is, is truly masterful. Um, so she's been someone I've been thinking about for a long time. And lastly is Felix Gonzalez Torres, who's um, a Cuban American artist that um, died of AIDS in, in the 90s and was part of um, Grand Fury and ACT UP. Um, and this piece in particular um, is the accumulated weight of both him and his lover um, in Candy. Um, and the candy itself is this swirl of blue and white. Um, so I think that in this piece, he was kind of referencing the coming together of his body and the body of his partner um, in this kind of sensual, beautiful, sparkly, sweet way. Um, and by inviting the viewer to take a candy, a piece of candy, um, the viewer is both kind of engaging in this um, sexual act subversively um, and also participating in um, the destruction of their bodies as they both uh, were dying of AIDS. Um, so I think that using beauty and materiality and seductiveness um, as a conceptual tool as well, in addition to a visual tool, was something that um, I remember being really struck by in his work. Um, so kind of going back um, maybe 12 years, this is um, a drawing I made when I was an undergrad at PAFA. Um, I was a junior and I had just gotten my studio for the first time. Um, and up until that point, I was making um, landscape paintings and still lifes, um, really kind of not engaging in content that was specific to my own experience. Um, and this, this series of, of drawings that I made came from um, a video that I made with a friend of mine when I was visiting Israel, um, just um, us hooking up. And when I came back to my studio after uh, winter break and looked at the video, um, it really resonated with me, like the, the composition, the color, the, um, the movement, the bodies, uh, there was something in it that I felt like I really wanted to work from. Um, and somehow that was the first time where subject matter and materiality came together for me in my practice, where kind of this like expressive gestural way that I was making still lifes and landscapes found a home um, in a content that I actually cared about. Um, and the kind of material sense uh, became analogous with the subject matter or the content. Uh, so I feel like that kind of, kind of um, coming together was this aha moment for me that I think is still very present um, in my practice. And this is a painting, oh, here we go. Um, this is the last painting I made when I was in grad school. Um, you can see that the reference was that drawing that I made in undergrad. Um, and this is also, I feel like after taking a detour and working um, in graphite and then acrylic, I went back to working in oil um, and kind of started finding my own language with materiality and color. And I feel like this is kind of the first, um, the first example of that. So I feel like after grad school, um, I graduated into a world that didn't, an art world that didn't really 
um, care about figurative painting, very different from today. Um, and most of the work that was being made and shown um, was mostly process-based um, abstraction. Um, so I kind of had a lot of time to just make my own work and think about my own content without any kind of exterior um, pressure to produce or show. Um, and I think that that was a really productive period. Um, and I think things kind of started shifting around my first solo show, which was in 2018 at 1969 uh, downtown. And I made this painting while I was a resident at the Sharp Polenta studio program. And that was probably like the biggest studio I had to that point. Um, so I was able to, to really work much larger. So this is the kind of scale that I'm working on now. Um, and this is 96 by 80. Um, <clears throat> And also, I feel like this is a good example of um, this idea that I've been thinking about in the past decade of how color and materiality could um, embody a certain bodily sensation or um, sense of light or a certain kind of meaning. Uh, so with this painting, which is of my um, partner sleeping in our, in our bedroom, um, I wanted to capture the physical sensation of just waking up and opening your eyes with a room that's fairly um, dimly lit and all the objects kind of seem to bleed into one another and kind of uh, radiate with the same um, sense of color, this like muted rainbow palette. Um, and also thinking about what, where I would be or who I would be encountering that. So kind of being um, preview to something that's really private, that's really intimate. Um, so thinking about the color and the materiality as a way to talk about a specificity <clears throat> of time, but also a specificity of a, a relationship. Um, so I made this piece and this piece, and they're both kind of Hockney, Hockney references in a way. Um, and that was from again, my first, my first solo show. Um, and around the same time, there have kind of become more and more um, presence for other queer artists working with similar subject matter. Um, so this is Louis Fratino, Felipe Baeze, Kyle Coniglio, who's right here, hi Kyle. Jonathan Linden Chase, Jennifer Packer, was an incredible show at the Whitney that you all have to see if you haven't already. Michael Stamm, Jenna Gribben, Salman Tour, and Devin Shimoyama. Uh, and of course, there's many more. Uh, this is kind of just like a, a, a small group. Um, but for me, it was really meaningful to suddenly be in conversation with other artists that were working uh, in a similar vein, uh, thinking about similar issues, but doing it in such different ways. Because um, it really relieved, I felt like for so many years, I had to really um, assert the terms of my practice and justify why I'm thinking about intimate subject matter or why I'm drawing from my own experiences or even why I'm working figuratively. And I think that once um, more and more people became interested in it and these practices became more visible, um, the conversation shifted to a much more specific, um, it became a much more specific um, and I could kind of explore things that were particular to my sensibility and to my content. Um, so I, it really allowed me, I think, to, to deepen my own practice. Um, so these are, um, these two paintings, are smaller, they're 18 by 24, which is kind of the other scale that I work at. Um, and they were done from direct observation. Um, and this is actually the first time that I was able to um, paint these explicit subject matter um, from observation, which was a really beautiful and very intense experience. Um, obviously I had to paint quite quickly. Um, and they were um, both included in this group show uh, at Periton called Them, uh, which included a bunch of the artists that I just mentioned. Um, so I feel like there was kind of becoming more and more of a conversation around um, queer figuration and um, kind of, you know, an emphasis on, on looking at, at um, 
how that experience is being depicted through various artists' practices. Um, and this is kind of a good example as well of um, how I work, where I, I would do these smaller paintings from observation and then uh, translate them into larger works. So the smaller paintings are almost like um, sections from the big paintings, uh, and the big paintings are kind of like a zoomed out version. Um, so obviously I have like the reference from the small paintings that I make, but also um, I take photos. Um, I'm not necessarily a, a purist when it comes to source material, um, but I, I do um, whatever, whatever works really. Um, and this is, this is one of the pieces that I had in my uh, second solo show, which was in 2019 uh, at Yossi Milo Gallery. Um, and for me, it's very important to have these very sexual work that are very explicit and talk about queerness in a way that's very direct and related to the subject matter um, next to other works um, that are kind of depicting different aspects of my life. Um, so this is my partner and his brother and his brother's family. Um, and this painting is quite big. This is two of those large canvases. So um, let's see, it is 96 by 160 inches. Um, and working big is for me um, so liberating because as, mu as much as it's an intimidating um, kind of proposition, um, I just love how much space there is for me to kind of play around and move material around and just let the paint kind of um, be itself. Uh, so here there's like tons of textures and different ways of like treating the surface um, from using oil stick to using these like very thick impasto where, where the rug is, for example. Um, I feel like the um, the one of the main reasons that um, it's important to me to kind of have this range of subject matter from something that's very explicit to something that's um, more, let's say, um, everyday, um, is because I feel like when I'm thinking about my own my own queerness, and obviously it's something that I would experience with like a partner or a lover. Uh, but it's also something that's present in my relationship with my family um, or even something that's present in my relationship with um, the, the state, let's say, um, in terms of like how I'm perceived and um, what freedoms are afforded to me or not afforded to me. Um, so I think that because it does permeate every every aspect of my life, um, it should also I'm I'm very curious or trying to investigate like how it also permeate, permeates um, through painting and how I could like express that um, in um, different subject matters. So this is again, uh, a smaller kind of the, the study so-called um, for this big one, for each, for each one of the figures, there was a, a small painting. Um, and the show was titled Likeness um, and included a lot of portraits of, of friends. So this is uh, the painter, Angelica Cunili. Um, my friend, John. Devon Shimoyama. Oren Penhasi is an incredible sculptor. Tommy Ka was an amazing photographer. Um, so there's just like a lot of people from kind of my community, from my um, surroundings. Um, and for me, thinking about portraiture um, really relates to capturing something um, that I identify in the person or that I know about the person, um, a certain kind of essence, which I feel like is almost like a cliche way of thinking about portraiture. But um, that's beyond kind of like the exactitude, let's say, of describing someone and uh, making something that looks like them. I think what really drives me um, in making these smaller paintings is trying to think about, does it feel like them? Is something that I recognize in them, that I know about them, that resonates with my relationship, exists within the painting? Um, and I think that that also relates to working from observation because if the person is right there in front of me, it really allows me to gauge um, almost like brushstroke by brushstroke, um, whether what I'm putting down on the canvas really um, 
connects with how how I feel about the person. Um, so I think that that in a way necessitates this observational process. Whereas I was if I would to do that with a photograph, um, it would just not it would be a completely different experience. Um, and also, I think that there's something about the naturalistic language, the kind of naturalistic drawing language that comes from working from observation for me um, that really grounds the paintings in a certain reality. Like, you know, you're looking at someone that exists, that is part of my life. Um, and that allows me to kind of be a lot more free and expressive with the color and the materiality. And in addition to these portrait portraits, um, I also make these dick portraits, um, also mostly um, of friends um, as well from observation. Um, and I feel like a lot of these are, um, for me at least, kind of are an attempt to, to make queer sexuality feel everyday and mundane, uh, that there's really kind of nothing um, let's say explicit or um, affronting about them. This is not meant to be shocking. This is just meant to be casual. Um, and I think that that's how I experience um, these moments as something that's just like a part of my continuum of life. Um, so I really wanted to, to have a, to feel as, um, as everyday and as casual as the portraits themselves. And these are some other paintings from the show. Um, this is again, a larger one, it's, 18, it's um, 96 by 80. And this is set in Phi Island, which I will talk a little bit more uh, about a little later. But this is the artist TM Davey, um, face down in the Mirac. And these are my good friends, Kyle, Robert, and James. This is the portrait of Robert and Kaya. And this is um, Jenna Gribben and her uh, now fiance, Mackenzie, at Metro. And my partner sleeping. This is my favorite painting from the show. Um, so after my show, I feel like I. Um, to me, at least it felt really successful and like so many people came and I got such ama amazing feedback. Um, and it was kind of a moment of trying to collect my thoughts and really investigate what this work means to me. Um, and I think I kept going back to this idea um, of freedom and trying to be free within my practice, but also um, just be kind of to feel free as a person and to have um, the confidence to really um, exist fully, um, both in my life and in my work. And this painting is set in Fire Island um, in the Pines. And Fire Island is um, an island off of Long Island with many, many communities. Um, but two of them are historically queer, um, the Pines and Cherry Grove. And in between, there's kind of this national park called, um, well, I, we call it the Mirac. I don't know what other people call it, but um, which is really stunning uh, with lots of low vegetation and little enclaves. Um, and it's been kind of this like cruising ground since forever. Um, and in general, Fire Island has been kind of like a queer haven since um, the 20s, the 40s, up to today, um, artists and writers have been coming there to work for so, so long. And um, from people like Jared French and Paul Cadmus, uh, David Hockney, um, today you can, you know, run into Wolfgang Telmans or Nicole Eisenman on the beach. Uh, so it's a really magical place. And I feel like for me, whenever I'm there, um, I really do feel kind of like the weight of... Um, like heteronormativity kind of like lifted off. Um, and so for me thinking about this idea of freedom was the perfect place to set this piece um, in. And it's basically an image of me drawing my friend, uh, which you can see. 
you. Um, and then two, um, two friends, um, Elon Cohen, who's a good friend, um, and Alex just kind of hanging out um, within the, and within the context of the piece, they could be cruising, they could be looking at us. Um, and I wanted it to feel like an open-ended narrative. Um, and I was talking to someone in my studio about this piece and um, he referenced Manet, which I think that was really, really resonated with me. Cause I think in, in so many of Manet's group scenes, um, there is this loose narrative that connects all the figures, but essentially each figure is really allowed to be themselves and kind of be portrayed as like a full person with an, with kind of a complete interiority. Um, so thinking about all these different elements in relationship to, again, this idea of like, of freedom, um, which was kind of preoccupying me at the time. And these are some of the small paintings. And I was also doing drawings when I was there. Uh, so these are gouache and color pencils. And I think they're like eight by 10 or something like that. So all of those kind of references went into the big painting. Um, and this is a big painting of uh, my partner sleeping. There's two of those that I made. Um, and this was for the Armory in New York in 2020. So minutes before COVID. Um, and this is, this is kind of a good example um, of this rainbow palette that I think comes up a lot in my work. Um, and just wanted to kind of talk to you guys about it a little bit. Um, I, I don't know if you relate, but I feel like whenever I see um, a rainbow kind of in nature, um, it's a very special moment and everything else kind of fades away and I'm just enthralled by this like beautiful visual experience. Um, and I was thinking about kind of this tr transcendent experience that's really communicated through color um, and how it could parallel moments in my own life. And I think that there's times in my relationship um, where I really kind of most intensely feel my love for um, my partner, for example, in this, in this painting, um, where kind of the, um, how special, our connection is or um, kind of the, the strength of our, um, our love uh, is most felt. Um, and I wanted to kind of create a connection between that experience within a relationship and kind of this, to find a, a parallel to that within color. Um, so to me, the, this like transcendence of the rainbow um, and these really quiet, intimate moments really came together. Um, and also I feel like the rainbow itself is such a queer signifier. So that also adds this other more textual, um, aspect to the color palette. So this is another one. Um, and then as I was saying, COVID, um, COVID descended and everything changed and we were all thrown into this insane journey that we're still on. Um, so I, like everyone else, stayed at home and couldn't really make it to studio um, and couldn't work on these large scale paintings and was kind of stuck at home um, and was thinking about what I could do. Um, and I kind of the most natural thing that I gravitated towards was going back to the way I was working when I was an undergrad, like these small drawings that I was making um, from video stills. So I went back to old source material uh, from like 2009, 2010 um, and started working from that um, source material again. And I think there was something kind of like that really brought me back to the core of my practice. And I think that despite kind of like expanding my subject matter and um, and you'll see also including things like landscape and flowers a little bit later. Um, I think the depictions of, of explicit sexuality have always been in the center of my work and really kind of energized um, and gave meaning to what I was doing. Um, and I think that it was interesting kind of 10 years after the first time that I've approached the subject matter um, to really have time to think about what it means to me. And I think I'm still learning about what, um, why I make these images and why, um, 
depicting kind of explicit subject matter is so meaningful. Um, and I think that part of it is really um, understanding how desire operates in general, like in, um, in all artwork, not just in queer artwork. Um, Cause I think there's a tendency to, to experience queer imagery as something that can only really represent queerness and doesn't have the gravity or um, the maybe shared meaning um, to be meaningful for everyone. Um, whereas straight desire historically, especially within painting um, has really had the privilege of standing in for um, really every, any possible subject matter that you can even imagine. Like if it's um, Delacroix um, in the in Liberty Leading the People um, using kind of like a beautiful bare chested woman to talk about France and the French Revolution or uh, Corbet, Origin of the World or Aang's um, The Source, like just Degas, like there's so many examples um, of mainly women being sexualized um, in service of other content. Um, whereas I feel like if I'm painting a dick, it really is only kind of limited to um, talking about queerness or queer desire. Um, so kind of insisting on depicting um, these sexualized images um, in a way that's tender, in a way that's um, ecstatic, I think connects it with a larger narrative about um, kind of a human experience um, and gives it hopefully um, more, I don't wanna say give it more meaning because I think it already has more meaning but or has all the meaning that um, it needs but allows for that meaning to be read um, and be accessed. So these are just some, some of my thoughts on why I do what I do. Um, so here are other paintings. Um, this is summer 2020. This is kind of um, going back to Fire Island and painting Friends, um, which was such a blessing at the time because I feel like we were all cooped up for so many months. Uh, so being able to go to the beach and breathe a little was really remarkable. And it was really fun to just take my little French easel and um, make all these portraits when I was there. And this is the first time um, that I painted flowers, actually. Um, I mean, I painted flowers when I was like six years old, but um, since then, this was the first time that I approached the subject matter. Um, and I, I feel like after painting portrait after portrait, um, I just felt like I needed to do something else. And it felt like it would be such a relief to um, work with something that's not like a figurative subject matter. Um, and these two guys had a beautiful garden um, and they very graciously allowed me to paint there. So I made this painting and this painting as well. Um, and I think after making these two paintings, it really opened up kind of a question of um, how does my language that's so tied to um, painting people, painting, <clears throat> painting friends, painting images that are sexual, um, how does that relate to kind of non-figurative subject matter? Um, and I think that for me, like I, I, if I have, for, for me to have a connection with, um, let's say like painting flowers or painting a landscape, it has to be connected to a certain kind of personal experience. Um, and again, Fire Island represents like it's almost like the whole landscape is just imbued with queerness in a way. So um, that kind of connected to my content. Um, whereas it's not something necessarily that you can see in the painting, but it was enough of kind of a motivation for me to, to make it. Um, and these are my good friends, Joe and Edgar, um, that we were staying at their house in Fire Island. And this actually ended up um, on bus stations in the city, which was really cool. Uh, so it was a, a project that the Public Art Fund did called Art on the Grid. Um, and it was 50 artists throughout the city, which I think was like combined with, um, you know, 
galleries being closed and us really only being able to be outside was such a special um, opportunity to show work. And I was really happy to kind of be part of part of the city in a way. Um, and another cool project I wanted to share is this portrait of Salman Tour. Um, and Salman and I um, are good friends and we um, painted each other as part of um, a tea magazine issue about friendship. Um, so we painted these paintings um, and then traded them, which was really fun. Um, so this is Salman and I, and this is the painting he's, he made of me, which I love. Thank you, Salman. Uh, so at this point, I was um, starting to get ready for my show that was in London. This that just closed. Um, that was this fall. Um, so none of these paintings actually made it to the show, but this was just um, kind of the beginning of developing the palette and different thoughts about subject matter for for what it's going to be. So a lot of this kind of primary colors, very um, lots of phthalos, lots of oranges thinking about um, Monk, for example. So these are kind of the beginning of, of the work that I was making. Uh, I really got into these like multicolor brushstrokes um, and thinking about how form could be rendered through the value of the colors. So like the phthalo green being the darkest, the Indian yellow being the lightest, and then within one brushstroke, um, creating a sense of volume. Um, which I spent a lot of time thinking about within, within my work, how different color structures um, could do multiple things at once. So again, this like rainbow palette. And both this painting and this painting uh, later inspired bigger paintings that are gonna be, that were part of my show in London. Um, so right before the pandemic, actually, um, my sister passed away from cancer, um, and I went, it was, this was like around February, um, and I went to Israel and, um, was there for the funeral and for the Shiva, which is like a Jewish mourning period of, of a week. Um, and that obviously changed, um, a lot <laughs> in many ways, uh, but I think it really deeply affected my work as well and how I thought about um, myself as a painter and what I wanted to describe and what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I think that my work was already kind of dealing with these existential ideas, um, mainly focused on like relationships and love and desire. Um, but I think that really expanded um, to thinking more about loss and mortality. Um, and this image, um, again, it's a very large landscape. It's 160, um, or no, wait, yes. 96 times two, whoever does math here, engineers, um, by 80. Um, and this is an image of me and my two brothers um, hiking in the mountains near where I live in Israel, which is, uh, as Mike pronounced, Yoknam, very uh, proficiently. Um, and there's, in this time of year in Israel in general, um, there's lots of anem anemones, uh, which are these red flowers, um, which are my favorite flowers. And I always think of them also as like, very specifically like Israeli, like that kind of always represented home to me. Um, and we were hiking in the mountains, which I've done endless times every time I would go home. Um, and we came across this beautiful field um, of anemones, and which I haven't seen before. So it always felt, it almost felt kind of magical. Um, and I think that that was a moment where I knew that it had to be a painting. Um, and I really wanted to use this like expressive expressionist language, so kind of referencing monk landscapes with the color and the swirls of the brush um, to talk about the turmoil um, and the turning inwards that um, I think loss uh, brings. Um, and also thinking about connecting with my family um, and the flowers as being these moments uh, of beauty and joy that still permeate through that process. Uh, so that's what that painting was about. 
And then like I was talking about before, um, kind of not relenting in terms of the queer content as well. So having kind of this one end of the spectrum being um, this very intense, morbid painting about um, death and loss, but also have this really um, super intense, sexual, explicit painting um, that's about kind of a certain a certain desire or a certain life force. Because um, to me, the two are very, very related. Uh, so this is a, a big painting. This is 96 by 80 as well. So this is the first time where the big paintings were not just kind of like a zooming out of the small painting, but actually like blowing it up to a larger scale. Um, and that really allowed for a material exploration and, and almost kind of a near abstract quality of the paintings. Um, so there were two of those that I made. Um, and I don't know if you guys can tell, but it's actually three people. It's not just two people. Um, and I feel like that's like a little um, bit of information that if you kind of stare at it long enough, it will reveal itself. Um, and I was thinking a lot about, and the title of these two paintings are Friends, Friends One and Friends Two. Um, and I was thinking about just the slippery nature of queer friendship and how um, kind of these traditional boundaries between um, kind of sexual relationships and um, friendship really dissolve. And it's, um, in my mind, at least a really special, beautiful um, connection. Uh, so that's something for the queers. Uh, <laughs> And then after compare, after completing these paintings, um, I was finally able to go back to Israel to visit my family. Uh, so it had been like a year since my sister passed away. Um, but obviously, I mean, they were hysterical and like the, they closed down the airport and there was just no way to go home. Um, so when I finally was able to go, I brought um, 20 something canvases with me and my paints and a little French easel. Um, and I would go out with my mom and we would, um, I would like paint in the mountains and she would talk to me about all our, you know, we'll gossip about the family and kind of share, share our feelings. Um, so it was a really special time. Um, so I made a bunch of these flower paintings. A little Van Gogh moment. And then uh, also portraits of my family. So this is my mom weaving, my brother, my nephew. And this is a friend and, and their baby, my niece. And then, um, Coming back from that trip where um, I was able to go there in March was really was like kind of the height of spring in Israel. Um, so everywhere in the north was just like covered in flowers. Um, and it was really just so kind of the life force of spring, I felt was very, um, very evident. Uh, so I went back to the studio and um, I made these two landscape paintings. This one is kind of a blowing up of the small flower painting. So this is very large, it's uh, 96 by 80 um, as well. And for me, it kind of parallels the really explicit paintings in terms of having this like close up um, image um, and also talking about a different kind of life force. If like the explicit paintings are kind of talking about desire or sexuality as kind of this like um, life giving, um, let's say like center, this is more about kind of the rejuvenation of spring and nature. Um, so the two kind of creating that parallel and as a way of also connecting um, work that's not figurative to the figurative work. Um, so this is, this is the view from um, the mountains near my parents' house. So kind of the same, um, the same landscape that I painted my brothers in. Um, but if the, pa the painting of my brothers was just like, turbulent, um, distraught kind of state of mind that I was trying to communicate. I think here it's a year later, much more sublimated, um, a different, just a different state of mind where um, spring came, kind of life re reappeared, uh, but there's still this settlement um, underneath that's communicated 
by the really intense texture of this piece, which is kind of <clears throat> hard to see, but um, there's tons and tons and tons of paint um, throughout the surface. Um, so I wanted it to both um, feel very light and open, but also extremely heavy at the same time. Um, and not having the figures allowed me to kind of disperse the um, emotional intensity that is usually concentrated in the portrait, let's say, um, in the, on the surface throughout the, <clears throat> throughout the painting. And this was the last painting that I made for the show. Um, and this one really came together extremely fast. I usually take about um, a month and a half, two months to make a painting. Um, and this one came together in like a week or two um, over two or three sessions. Um, and again, kind of thinking about these exuberant transcendent moments with a partner um, and it being communicated through the materiality and, and the color. Um, and here are some install shots of the show. The show is titled Give Me Love, um, which is kind of a reconfiguration of a Robin song, Show Me Love. Um, I was just, I really wanted to make the, um, the plea of the song a little bit more intense. Um, and also just kind of wanted to, to include the word love in the title. Um, cause I feel like after this extremely difficult, um, intense year that I've had, that we all, we've all had, um, or almost two years at this point, um, kind of thinking about how love is really the, the ultimate subject matter of, of all my pieces. Um, so kind of bringing that into the conversation. And then a little bit more lighthearted, I came back from um, London right to the armory. Um, so these are some of the pieces that um, I made for that. Um, and this is again, set in Fire Island. And these are, um, this is Carlos Mota and uh, John Arthur, who um, are artists and good friends. And this is my friend Willie in my apartment. And the final painting I want to show you is this, which is actually up right now at the Frick, um, which in terms of um, life highlights, <laughs> it ranks pretty high. Um, I was invited uh, to be part of this project called Living Histories, which um, a few pieces that um, are traveling this year from the Frick, two Holbeins, one Vermeer and one Rembrandt, um, were going to be replaced temporarily uh, by work um, by young um, queer figurative painters. Uh, so it's myself and Salman Tour, Jenna Gribben and Toyin Adetula. Um, and we're, we were each paired with a different artist um, and I was paired with Holbein, uh, which for me, I feel like I was obsessed with Holbein for so many years. It was um, just a dream come true um, to be able to have that direct connection and that direct conversation uh, hanging in the in the museum. Uh, and this is the mind blowing <laughs> and cell shot that I still don't really believe. Um, and I was thinking a lot about kind of this idea of touch with Holbein because um, seeing a Holbein in person, you really are just so struck by the materiality of the fur, of the um, of the velvet, of the stubbles on the on the chin. Um, his, his figures really do feel so alive. Like it doesn't really even feel like a painting. Um, and I think that that's really due to this like sense of tactility that, that he's able, able to evoke through the paint use. Um, so I was thinking about similar issues, um, but much more materially and less illusionistically. So that was kind of like my thought process with that. Um, and that's it. That's my lecture. Thank you, guys. Hi. How are you? <laughs> your work. Of course, Thank I'm a great fan of your work. Um, the confidence in your work comes through very clearly. And then your paintings are so personal and intimate. So can you talk about the process of one, once the painting is finished, I was going to ask, you know, when do you know it's finished? Once it's finished and now you're releasing it to the world, it's something so personal and something 
that you've spent so much time with. Can you describe your process or your thoughts or your feelings as you're releasing the work? Sure. I mean, I think that each painter is different. Um, and some painters are really like, don't like like selling work or showing work or like having work leave the studio. But for me, it's it's kind of a relief. I, I like to just let them go and have their own lives in the world. Um, and also I've been working with this subject matter since I was like 15. Like this is not, this is something I've been doing for decades. So I think that I kind of got over whatever embarrassment I had. Um, it was there for sure. And I think, you know, whenever like, like my mom came to London to see the show and I was kind of like, look away, mom. Like, I, like but I feel like, yeah, it's just, it's part of the work. And, and I think that in a way I, I use my personal life, but it's not about my personal life. Um, there's no like specific information that people can like get from the paintings about me. They're not really autobiographical in that sense. Um, I think it's just, this is the resource that I have. And this is the kind of, this is the emotional response that I have. And I'm kind of articulating that. So I'm kind of thinking about it in more, um, kind of large scale abstract terms rather than like, oh, I'm sharing something that's like deeply, um, that I wouldn't want anyone to know, for example. Yeah. Hello. Um, do you ever feel like you have conflict with um, things like stylistic continuity and like this a certain pressure to put out things that people have um, admired before, um, like from a purely visual stance or like a color stance, or if you feel like you should stay, I don't know, aligned to a certain path that you've done before and you're happy with? even though there might be something you want to push that's different, if that makes sense. I don't think I understood the second half of your question. Um, you could, oh. Basically just, do you have any like inner conflict with stylistic continuity? Um, I think that when I had my first show in 1969, I remember, um, or it was like a, a two person show right before that, and someone reviewed it, it was like a blog or something. And, and they wrote that it looked like a group show and that I haven't chosen my style or whatever. And I remember being really upset about that. Um, but I think for me, it was really a process of like, not, um, not giving up on any particular impulse. And, and if I wanted areas to be like, I think it was very important for me that certain areas in the paintings are, are very described and certain areas are really abstract and certain areas are very textured. And I think that just formally it was a challenge to kind of put it all together. Um, so when I was in grad school, the way that my paintings kind of worked were really in like these different sections. So each section was painted differently. And I think that just like getting better as a painter over time, I was able to integrate it more and make it feel like it's all part of the same world. Um, so I think I would say that I definitely was struggling stylistically in terms of trying to figure out how to pull off what I wanted to pull off. Um, but I always kind of had an idea of what that would be. It just took me a while to, to get there. Um, so I don't really view it as like different styles. It's just kind of different means of working that all serve the same end. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> um, I was struck by what you said about how different color structures can do multiple things at once. And that's a particular gift of your talent and of painting. <laughs> and I was wondering if you think about cinema when you're working, because your work seems aware of cinema without being cinematic somehow. And I don't know how you do that. It's very hard to do. So I'm wondering what you think about, you know, do you, are you really engaged with film 
because it almost seems like you are aware of the camera, you're aware of photography, but your work isn't necessarily photographic. It's almost as if you leapt to a new place that's uh, almost like more aware of Moybridge than, oh, interesting. <laughs> you know, or aware of, uh, you know, how to, how to fix an image that feels like it's going to move. Well, I feel like um, that's a really interesting question because when I was um, up until 2014, I think I was like exclusively working from these video stills. I would take a video, um, they were mostly like sexual videos and then just like that I would make myself and then um, like pause on the still and then paint from that. Um, and at some point it just felt really suffocating. Like I was kind of, I the way that I was engaging with the image, the photographic image did not allow me the freedom that I was kind of taking all these different like liberties with the color and texture and materiality and all that, but the image itself or the drawing language just felt very stilted um, and kind of too tied to the photograph. And then I started to kind of work from observation, um, which for me was like a huge shift. And I think it took me a few years to just figure out like, what I'm even trying to do. Uh, but I think that that aspect of like, switching to working from observation was really like really liberated me from um, a lot of the baggage that I kind of was carrying around with the photograph. So now I'm able to kind of use photography, but just as a useful tool and not necessarily something that like dictates decision-making. Um, and in terms of film, I'm not really like a film aficionado. So I don't really, it's not something that I'm like carrying in my consciousness when I'm painting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you felt like when you graduated, the art world wasn't really interested in figurative work. Do you feel like at some point there's going to be a saturation with artists working with the figure or do you feel this kind of pressure to stay innovative or how do you kind of approach that or foresee like taking your art in the future when the art world has those shifts again? I mean, they will, right, inevitably. Um, and I think it's an exercise in kind of letting go of control um, and having kind of experienced um, a period of time where people were just not engaged in what I was doing um, and what other people were doing um, that, were, that was figurative. Um, it's just, you know, I, there was a lot of emotional processes that I had to go through in terms of like telling myself that, what I'm doing was like valid, despite the fact that like people didn't really care. And, you know, like a lot of it was kind of leaning on friends, talking to people, um, getting validation from the work, getting validation from like what my peers were telling me, as opposed to seeking out external validation that was just like not really there in, in the scale that it is now. Um, so I think that it, it just kind of taught me that the kind of the only anchoring aspect of being an artist is your community and the work that you're making and what's happening in the studio and what's happening like again within your very close um group of friends and everything else is obviously like very helpful in terms of like you know showing and selling and like sustaining yourself as, as an artist but um that's not I feel like putting putting your self-worth on that kind of validation as an artist is not, it's just not stable. You can't, it'll just drive you crazy. Um, so I think that there's kind of this like Zen element of like, just really believing in what you're doing and, and believing your own purpose. And then if it, if it gets validation, then that, that is great. But like, as long as you still have that kind of core, um, I feel like that, that was kind of my way of, of staying grounded. Um, and it's, you know, it is scary because on one hand, like, like, you just don't know um, what's going to happen and what, like, are people just going to not care? Like, I feel like these are thoughts that we all have as artists. Um, but that's what it is. And you just have to keep going. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, first off, oh, first off, I want to say, like, I love how unapologetically gay your work is and very <laughs> open. But I was wondering if you ever questioned or or felt discouraged of like 
portraying and depe- depicting these like very explicit and gay scenes? Yes. <laughs> I have been very discouraged and doubtful of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like from the very beginning, like there was doubts all along. Like, oh, is this, is this, is this too gay? Is this so dumb? Is this just like, is this meaningless? Like, um, and also like getting feedback from galleries, from collectors that like, like I remember studio visits where people were like, oh, can we can we tell our friends it's like a guy and a girl instead of like two guys, like things that you would never even imagine, like people say in studio visits, um, they will. Um, or like even gallerists, like trying to dissuade me from showing explicit work, like not anyone I've worked with recently, but um, it's definitely there. There's a lot of pushback. Um, it's not, you know, I feel like it's easy to exist within the art world and forget that these images are actually like our radical and are pushing against a lot of people's conceptions. Um, And I think that I don't really think of them that way um, and I don't paint them that way. Um, But when they do interface with the world, sometimes that definitely happens. Um, But I feel like, you know, it's, 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 it really is the core of my work and that's what I want to do. And I feel like I never really questioned that. It was just like something I had to deal with and, still have to deal with sometimes <laughs> less so now but yeah um this is kind of like a more general question but now that you like have like kind of like a stylistic world that you feel like rooted in or like a vocabulary of like color and image and language and you're like looking back on your trajectory I'm just curious like what advice you'd have for undergraduate like student like us like how, as we're trying to like explore, especially at Cooper, which is very interdisciplinary and you could go in any direction you want, as we're trying to like anchor ourselves to some like f- world or form that feels meaningful, like what advice you'd have for that like giant process? <laughs> I mean, like anything. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I feel like for, thank you for that question. I feel like it is a it is a giant process. And I think that's really important to keep in mind that that's not something that's going to be confined to like a four year program or six years or 10 years. Like this is something that you're going to keep that we're all doing throughout our practice. Um, but I do feel like kind of going back to this idea of like, like figurative painting, not really being something that people were really amenable to for a big part of kind of my education. I feel like I had a lot of guilt working figuratively. Um, and I, and I think I made choices within my paintings that were kind of coming from a place of defensiveness, um, to kind of deflect a certain kind of read or to have the work read like as okay, like it's okay to make this, you know what I mean? And I think that that all came from insecurity. Um, and in retrospect, that was like a huge waste of time. Um, and I think that, so to me, I feel like now I, I really am trying to kind of practice a lot more acceptance and, and not, and even things that now I'm insecure about um, to remember that actually there are strengths um, and try to embrace them and see like, and try to be, to stay committed even to things that are maybe in the moment, like I feel like um, embarrassed by, or um, I don't know if, if that makes sense, but just this idea of um, just really st- trying to identify and stay committed to the things that you care about and that will kind of carry you through. Um, and I think the formal process will just come. I mean, it takes very, especially for painting, it just takes years to figure out like a way of working and a process that feels both flexible and your own. Um, and I just wouldn't, you know, don't, I wouldn't put this like thesis pressure on it. Um, so that would be my advice. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Do you have any advice for younger queer artists sort of petrified of in any way being queer in their art (laughs) or at all? Because you clearly have, you know, this sort of very lap skill and you're very capable of illustrating this but especially like for younger artists it is very intimidating for a variety of reasons 
would you have any advice for people who feel like if they were to put their art onto certain topics, it would be, you know, considered, I don't know, it would be turned away. Or as you said, like, you know, the things you talked about, like, how would you, you know, advice you would give to the younger you, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, if it's something that you care deeply about and that is what you want to make work about and express, then that has to be the work. Um, And it could take time maybe to feel comfortable with it or to share it. Um, But as long as you're kind of tapping into whatever is like truly exciting to you, um, I think that that will provide the motivation and also the desire to share because it does, because if it's something that you're proud of and that feels represent you, um, I think that that's kind of the most important part. But also I would say that not all queer artists need to announce their queerness in explicit terms. Like queerness is very expansive and there's many, many forms and ways um, to talk about it. Um, And I think that I'm always conflicted about making work that feels almost like, am I like self stereotyping by making these sexual works? Am I reducing, reducing like a queer experience to just the sexual? So I feel like these are conversations that I have with myself like on the other end of things. Um, So I think that it's always going to be problematic. It's always going to raise a lot of questions. There's always going to be things that um, are going to be unanswered. Um, But I think as long as you're kind of identifying what drives you and your work and kind of stay, stay that course, then things will find a way. Yeah. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time, Jerome. Thank you guys. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it.